Hi everyone, this is Katie, and I'm doing a video today over my focal embouchure dystonia. So I've been having a lot of um, questions lately, um, people asking me to um, show kind of more of like what I do that helps me get through my playing because I play in brass quintet and I also play in an orchestra. But the orchestra, of course, right now, I'm not playing in because of the pandemic, but the brass quintet I play in every week um, and we rehearse and then we also have been recording performances. Um, for upcoming events but um, so I've had a lot of questions coming in about asking like what do I do how do I um, handle my focal dystonia because it's been almost 12 years now that I've had it and um, of course on my blog if you don't know my blog it's living with embouchure dystonia and I documented my recovery throughout all those years um, from start to now even though somewhere along the line it became a little more about resources and things like that um, but anyways, getting to the point, I am here today to show you uh, a little bit about what kind of helps me with my playing and um, currently. And again, this is just very subjective. So what I advise is not going to work for everyone. I feel like everybody has their own individual, like how they're affected by dystonia is, is very various because dystonia affects us in the most subtle ways. Like where we need the most amount of control or we, we need the most amount of subtle um subtle control in our playing like whether that's like fading out or like really quiet playing or like you know decrescendoing or just like anything that's really delicate or intricate it just really affects us even our middle register playing where it's supposed to be the most easiest to play that's where we lack the most amount of con control because that's the register where we're kind of in our pivot range especially on horn and trumpet we're kind of in our pivot range and um in that pivot range you know like in the high range we kind of use a lot of like corner muscles and tighten up and use a smaller aperture in the lower register we kind of drop our jaw uh, for a lot of people they drop their jaw they open up a lot more we use a lot more uh, what some people call hot air or heavy air or something but in the middle register that's where it's kind of like you know like purgatory i call it purgatory because it's like you're just kind of um you know you have to kind of have that that flexibility in the middle register like if you're coming down from a high note and jumping into your middle register and landing on a middle register note it's like you have to have that lightness of control you can't really like let go like you can in the pedal register where you can just let loose but you also can't really tighten up like in a high register so here in the middle register is where we're affecting the most so um with that being said I'm gonna go ahead and explain where my current kind of symptoms are. So um, I feel like I'm around like 80%, um, 85% of my abilities regained. So it has come a long ways. That's not to say that I don't have relapse days. Sometimes I have really bad relapse days and it's just like, whew. But there are very few, uh, f there are very few of them that occur. It's probably like maybe once a month or once every other month that I feel really heavily affected. Um, but with only 85% of my abilities back, again, there's still, there's a lack of control in certain areas. But anyways, I'm not going to go into detail about that right now because I want to kind of start just telling you about what kind of helps me with my current uh, preparation. So there's a couple things. First of all, if you're able to play still um, and you think that you're at a, a good enough area playing where it's like, well, yeah, I feel around like 85% of my planes back too and or I can play you know some concerts a little bit of concerts but I'm not quite fully there um, back to 100% um, maybe this will apply to you a little bit more but it's good to watch because I will be going through what I do so the first thing is that with focal embouchure dystonia we are very aware of our bodies we're very aware of all the subtle changes because over the years you just become used to feeling where they affect you the heaviest so the first thing I, I take account of, like almost every day, it's almost automatic when I wake up. It's like I can tell if my symptoms are really bad or not because what will happen is like um, with my focal dystonia, I can tell it affects me from right in between my shoulder blades, like that area. I, I say mid back, but it's not like mid lower back. It's like mid back, like right below the shoulder blades back here. And it raises all the way up to my neck here. And that's usually where I'm the most tense when I hit the heaviest with my relapses is, is this upper body from the mid back all the way up to the, like up to here, literally up to here, where my jaw joint and my jaw and my cheekbones meet, where the nerves meet here too. Um, so it's, it's just this whole upper body that I'm very aware of, especially when I wake up. Um, so 
the first couple things that I do is that, so I'm, I'm taking account of how tense I am in the day, and this is an automatic process now, but before it's like I had to really journal, like what, I had to do inventory of like, not only assess my body, but also assess like how I felt when I played. So you have to go beyond the plane, you have to assess how your body feels like right away when you wake up, right how it's feeling throughout the day because dystonia affects us in, in our daily stuff. We may not realize it at first for the first couple of years. We don't realize it because we're not tuning in. We're not picking on up on that perception of our body because we're not being tuned into certain things about our body that we were never tuned in before. So for example, if all of a sudden you have to tune into your third toe on your foot, you're going to be like, it's going to take me a while to pick up on that because I'm not used to tuning into that because that's just, you know, like, let's say you want to regain control of your third toe on your third foot, you lost control of it, but you're all of a sudden you're having to focus on that, but you're not used to being highly aware of it. Like every time you wake up, you're just, because your whole life you haven't had to think about it. So it's kind of the same with focal dystonia. It's like, we don't realize where it kind of affects us in our bodies until we start really tuning into our bodies and really getting used to assessing where things are at. So the first thing I kind of do in the morning when I wake up is that I kind of get, I already know a general feel for like how things are going to go. <laughs> I already know. But a couple things that I do that help me out that can probably help you out too is the first things you want to do is assess your, your body movement. So um, body movement, which is range of motion. So the first thing you want to do, and I do stretches in the morning. So um, range of motion, you're going to test while you're doing this. So for example, what I kind of practice doing, because I have so much tension in my neck and, and especially my jaw right here and, um, and my shoulders, I kind of do assessment of the room, like, or not assessment of the room, but I look around the room. And what I do is like, you see the square of the room and what you want to do is you want to kind of like look up and follow around and and you want to look all around like just follow the lines the, the corners of the room and go all around and while you're doing that try to feel how does my but you want to sit very straight with good posture you want to sit up in a chair of course or on the bed like this and you want to keep in one spot so it's not like you want to move like this you want to keep your your whole body in one spot you want to move your head and look around in in this kind of direction. So it's like you're be, you're assessing your neck movement. Also, this helps you start getting to move the eyes a little more too as well, which in some focal dystonia cases, the eyes do affect the plane. That's in some odd cases, but I think that 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 more pertains to those who are affected with eyelid dystonia if you happen to have that as a, a also a secondary dystonia to what you have. Um, but anyways, you're going to move around and then to test your range of motion when you're stretching, first you're going to try to uh, reach your right ear to your shoulder. And just, And I want you to be very aware of how far it goes. Don't force it, just try to see, does my neck feel tense? Does it feel like my muscles are allowing me to move flexibly in that direction? And then the same in the left. Sometimes what you'll find is that you'll actually have either like a spasm or an intense like knot in one side of the neck. And so I take account of that. I might be like, wow, my right side of my neck is really tense today. It's really tense today. And I feel like it's just not allowing me to move all the way to the right. So I, I take that into account. I'm going to go ahead and stretch that out. And I'm going to show you some tools here that I use. Um, the same with the movement of up and down, like moving your head up and down. And this is kind of pertains to kind of like what Dr. Far Faria says. To do but I was doing this before I even you know joined his online course which I kind of took just to see what it was all about but of course it doesn't have a specialization in in focal embouchure dystonia it more deals with like writer's cramp um hand dystonia but not anything not a musician's course really and when it comes to embouchure dystonia there's not really anything on there except for the things that pertain to cervical dystonia or um uh oral mandibular dystonia which is the face but again it's not it's not catered to you so it's like there's only kind of this general thing that you do but anyways I, I was doing this before I even even knew about what his 
uh, work entail like involved. Um, and so this is basically what I learned from my chiropractor and also from my uh, my myofascial therapist and uh, acupuncturist like way back when. So yeah, testing your range of motion. So you want to move your neck in as many directions as you can and kind of feel what your range of motion is in your neck. And you take account of, to, of like, okay, this is where I feel restricted. This is where I things are kind of odd. It's like, wow, I didn't realize that I couldn't, you know, whenever I tilted my head this way, it would spasm up or it would spasm or I'd get a huge knot or I'd get a zinger, like a nerve. A zinger is like when you feel like a nerve shoot in the back of your neck. You might say, wow, I didn't realize how constricted my, my neck movement was or my whole upper body. And the same with the shoulders. Well, you're stretching them and you're stretching them out. You want to kind of assess how they are doing, how they're feeling. How far does this tension reach? Because the main thing about focal dystonia is that, yes, the, the tension is a result of the two muscles. Um, what is it called? Oh, gosh, this is going to kill me. There's one muscle that's fighting another muscle. It's like the antagonist muscle and the antagonist or whatever, but they're both supposed to meet together to create this balance in order for, because whenever you execute a movement, there's supposed to be this balance of the two muscles coming together and they work together to create this movement. But what happens with dystonia is that they're fighting. So the muscles they're fighting, they don't know how to control the movement because there's not, a, there's a lack of sensory. There's a lack of sensory. So what they do is they fight and that creates the involuntary con contraction. So it's like as soon as you form this and you go to blow out, your body says, I'm searching for a mouthpiece. I'm searching for something to blow into. I'm playing the horn. And the brain says, I'm playing the horn. But when you go to do that, when you go to do that, the muscles automatically go into, wait, I don't, I'm not picking up on anything. I'm not picking up on this. I'm not picking up on where you're, you're asking me to go or I can't sense where the mouthpiece is. It feels far away or it feels, it just feels like not normal. I can't really find a comfortable spot or I can't find a spot at all. Like there's no sensory there at all, no perception. So it's like when those muscles are contracting, you can imagine when you're able to still kind of play but you still have also focal dystonia, it's very taxing. It's like you you have all these muscle contractions happening, so it's very taxing. So it's like even just a normal playing rehearsal is at least you know two to three times more taxing than not having focal dystonia. Because it's like you may sound like at a decent level, but people don't realize like how much work your little muscles are doing because they're they're constantly fighting this battle. So you're constantly having to adapt to them and really tune into them and adjust to them as they're fluctuating throughout the rehearsal because they're just constantly um, going in all kinds of different directions and it feels like you're, you're fighting your own little inner battle um, with your body. You're like, okay, it's going this way so then I need to balance, counterbalance it by going this way or I need to, instead of doing tongue, I can tell, I gotten so good to the point where I can tell like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, it's not gonna, I can't tongue here. And some passages I can, I'm like, okay, I can, I think I can tongue here, or I can tongue here. But then there's other passages where I'm like, nope, I just know it's not, it's feeling groggy today, it's feeling really muddy, really sludgy with my tonguing today. So when I play in this specific register, I know exactly what notes it's going to affect, so I'll kind of alternate between tonguing and um, air attacks. So it's like, I'll try to use alternating both, or I might just switch to air attacks the whole time, or just do legato tonguing. Um, at the worst, when you're having a really bad relapse day, or when when I used to have really bad relapse days, I just slur everything because I couldn't I couldn't tongue. So it's like one of those things where you you're fighting these movements. It's not that you're fighting them. How do I say this? Because if you try to fight them, if you try to force them to work, they end up repelling you even further. Um, but if you let go. If you relax and just let things happen, they still fight you the whole way. So the key thing for me was finding um, where the tension was because these muscles fighting together all the time is very taxing. So even though the tension is a byproduct of the dystonia, the tension is the first 
like huge physical obstacle that's going to be the primary actually the primary obstacle in rehabilitation is relieving the tension because it matters how what matters most to me is how i prepare and also how i um do self-care afterwards those are the two main things that have helped me the most is how do i prepare how do i do my prep work throughout the day before playing and how do i pace myself and then how do I do self-care afterwards? Because those two things matter. So it matters more about what you do outside of your plane than what you do with your plane, if that makes sense. It's equally as important, if not more, at certain stages of, of recovery. So for example, when I wake up in the morning, I now what I do is I take my vitamins. I also take collagen. Um, you don't have to take collagen, but um, before that i was doing just like joint supplements which is kind of the same thing because collagen helps boost your tissues tissue in your joints um so like if you're having arthritis or you're having like hand aches or bone aches or ankle aches or anything collagen really helps with that um because and i just take the neo neo cell i just order off amazon um but it helps with the the joint support and um you can also do the powder as well. I did that for a while. It's really gross, <laughs> but um, the collagen supplements really help with the with your tissue with helping battle this amount of movement that's going on in your jaw. Because you're also your jaw is getting really overworked from constantly having to move in different directions too. Because for example, I'm at the stage where my my jaw really juts forward. I have to move my jaw really forward when I actually play in my middle and upper register where before in the past it would go way back before I had dystonia, it would be way like this way. But now it's like really outwards. It's almost like I, I look like I have like a protruding jaw like when I play because I my, I have no lower lip control. I have no lower lip uh, flexibility. I have no sensory in one side of my lower lip too. There's no, there's also, what is it called? Um, lack of it's almost like muscle atrophy kind of on one side um but just in my lower lip not really in the side of the face but in my lower lip so you can see even when i'm talking um if you ever watch videos of me you'll notice like there's one side where this side when my dystonia symptoms are really flared up you'll notice that there's one side where my face gets really like it looks like you can tell it looks like the muscles are pulling everything this way because these muscles are overcompensating for the lack of muscle control on this side of my face this side of my face you can tell like look I can't so that's the other thing I do so when I test my range of motions I test my neck motions my head motions um, what's my range of motion for the day and where are my tension where is all the tension at is it in my neck is it in my low back and getting so good to the point where you can find specifically where it's at so it's like oh yeah i feel it right in this spot it's right here and then knowing the anatomy knowing like okay i know exactly what that muscle is or you know i know that it's in my buccinator or you know it's it's in my metallus like right in my chin here it's like right in the center today so i know that i'm gonna lack lower lip control really badly today because i feel the tension right there so it's like you get so good to the point where you can tell like just pinpoint like you know one little spot you'll be like it's right here it's just right there not there not there not there not there right here is where the twitch is um so it's like you get used to um to assessing your body but the other thing I do is also um, testing the range of motion of my facial movements. So like a lot of you read my blog, I do um, I do upper back stretches, I do neck stretches, I do uh, facial stretches, I do um, stretch, I do massage on the outside of my face, but I also do myofascial release, which is going inside my mouth with my fingers and stretching uh, my uh, muscles around my face as well um so it's a lot of stretching so the basic thing is the addressing the tension so not just addressing the tension in the in the upper body but also in the face so how do we we figure out where we lack range of movement in our face because our dystonia affects us yes when we're playing yes it primarily affects us when we're playing 
But there's another interesting way that people never really think about assessing their facial movement abilities is testing side to side because I, my dystonia, I know it affects me side to side for sure. And this is not uncommon in all dystonia cases. There's usually, it's either upper extremity, lower extremity, left side, right side affected more. Um, so with me, it's my, my left side lacks the range of motion. So for example, <laughs> I'm gonna look really silly here. I'm gonna try and move my right eyebrow up and down So you can see it moves and it's not quite independent of this eyebrow and it doesn't have to be independent but you can tell when it's too tied into the into relying on the other motions the other movements of the other side of the face too much because you're like i should be able to <laughs> do this more independently so that was good it felt independent even though of course there are other muscles moving here and that's fine but over on this side i noticed when i try to move my eyebrow up and down you see it's not independent from this one I, I can try okay and the same thing with the cheek so I'm gonna do a um, like a what's it called like a smirk I'm gonna pull this right corner to the back side of my ear I'm gonna pull it back to my ear but I'm gonna do it very slowly and I also do these in the form of stretches too. So it's like I'll raise my eyebrows and I'll like hold them like really tight and hold them really tight for like a minute or a minute and a half and then release them. And then the same with this, when I'm testing my, my facial movements and like what I have control of or what I lack control of, um, I assess those and write those down, but I also do stretches with them too. So I'm gonna move this corner all the way, try to move it back to my ear. I say move back to my ear because it feels like I'm moving it back to my ear. And I'm going to slowly do it. That's the other thing, you need to do slow movements. You can't just be like, do it really fast. Like, okay, there, I smirked. No, you wanna do it really slowly, so. So you see, I had a spasm there. So I haven't done any of my stretches for today, so this is probably a good thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you. I'm gonna move it slowly again. And this time I'm gonna do a stretch. I might cover my face because I'm embarrassed, okay? Just bear with me. Spasm right here. So yeah, what I basically do is I pull it all the way back there and then I squeeze like as tight as I can. I hold that for like a minute, a minute and a half. Not, you don't want it to like hurt, but you want to feel that tension release. It's like doing any form of stretches. You want to hold it long enough that you feel that tension release. But if it hurts too much, don't do it. But you also don't want to do it too lightly either. You want to be able to get that stretch and feel that muscle release. And so I go through and I do this on the other side too. So watch this, I'm gonna try and do it on this side. So I definitely felt it more up in here, where in this side, the, the spasm is right here. Over here, it's more deep inside here. I can feel it. So it's like, how do I say this? It's not necessarily, I don't want you to see this as overanalyzing because, um, you know, when it comes to recovery, you know, when you are injured or you are set back, whether it's dystonia or some type of injury, you have to take account of your body. So it isn't overanalyzing. Yes, you want to have a balance because, but the main thing about recovery is when you're in recovery, you're not approaching it like you're a performer. It's not like you're sitting there and saying like, well, I gotta work on this and I gotta perfect it and I gotta practice and get this out of here. No, that's that's overanalyzing. When you're thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm thinking so much about like what my face looks like when I'm playing. No, 
that's that's kind of over analyzing that's like more focus on a performance mentality but when you're in recovery mentality you're more fo focused on how does my body feel where does the tension lie where is it because you need to get so used to knowing exactly where it's at so you know what stretch to use or what type of uh method or thing you need to do that can help you address where that tension is because again the tension although it's a byproduct that's the main big wall getting in the way the two things i feel that get in the way of the most musicians is this tension and also this huge tension but also um the mentality of recovery um being able to get through the grieving process and get to a state where you're able to really tune into your body through mindful awareness because mindful awareness isn't where you're like judging yourself for your playing or you're not judging yourself where you're doing these things you're not thinking oh my gosh this is really bad it's more like you're taking into account these these observations and you're thinking scientifically about it like uh john said um uh jonathan viker in my one interview the, the trumpet player um, that you have to think scientifically about it when you're going through recovery because you're not again You're not perceiving parts of your body that you weren't aware of before and in order to get aware of them and understand your body more fully You have to tune into these areas and realize okay, what's going on here? What's really going on here? Is it just it's not playing technique? It's not playing technique related. This has nothing to do with playing technique. This has to do with the body This has to do with the body functioning. This has to do with muscle and facial control and, and brain signals um and so you want to think of it almost like um not that it's bell's palsy but you want to imagine almost like let's say somebody had bell's palsy or they had a stroke and they lost control of certain muscles um you want to think of it almost like you're dealing with atrophy to a sense so it's like when you think of it that way you're like yes of course i have to be focused on on what's going on here because if I don't, I can't just tell my body, hey, do this, and then it does it, because it doesn't. It doesn't do it. So what do you expect? So sorry, I'm being kind of <laughs> harsh here. But um, yeah, I, it's just we get a lot of crap for thinking, for assessing our body and thinking about it this way when we're going through recovery, because people think that it's just playing related. It's not just playing related. So um, yeah, so I assess, I do all these different facial movements. I do, and people are gonna ask me what they are. Oh my gosh. So I'll try to go through a couple here and you can always message me if you wanna know more or look at my blog because everything is on my blog. Everything is already on my blog. Everything on that side panel is on my blog. Um, anything important that I've, I've, I've wanted to say. Um, so the, the first thing is that um, the first couple stretches that I do with my face. So I also do tongue stretches too. So you can look up jaw stretches. I do uh, TMJ stretches or jaw stretches, uh, tongue stretches, um, facial stretches, <laughs> both inside and out. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but mainly with the facial stretches, you just wanna experiment. So it's not hard to figure out like how to move your muscles in different ways, you know, or make facial expressions. But but try different facial expressions, but do them really slowly. So let's say you're like, oh, I'm just gonna make a random facial expression. But do it really slowly, or do it first, and then do it really slowly. <laughs> I'm doing what I call the sour lemon. So you wanna assess like, okay, are my muscles here, um, how do they feel? Because obviously I'm, I'm moving the zygomatic muscles right here, so how do they feel? Um, what's going on there? How does it feel side to side? How does it feel when they move together? Um, how does it feel when I move both corners together? How does it feel when I move both corners separately? How does it feel when I uh, pucker really slowly? And move my muscles very slowly outwards? Um, how does it feel when I roll them in very slowly? So like really just experimenting and going through, uh, it's just a lot of exploration and, and figuring out your own body and how the dystonia affects you individually. So yeah, so I go through that. I take the collagen, which helps with the joints. Um, and then um, <laughs> uh, my brother-in-law is teaching lessons. So if you hear um, mouthpiece buzzing or trumpet playing or ukulele or other instruments, that's him. But uh, yeah, I take my vitamins and then I also do uh, daily fiber. Not that that really has anything to do with dystonia, but eh, it might help. <laughs> you never know. Um, the other thing is that 
uh, some tools that I use when I'm working on my body is this this is a, a back support a limbic like um, lumber stretch sorry lumber stretch um, back support so it's like you can use it you can use it like while you're laying down on you know, on the floor or you can use it up against the wall like your back on the wall um, but this helps with a lot of the back issues that I have because I am a very like heavy upper body person like I feel like I have the most bulky muscles in my upper body that any woman has ever had <laughs> um, and so I have to do I have a lot of pressure on my uh, mid back so this really helps with just stretching things out, especially when I'm feeling a lot of tension. Also around the neck too, because you can also use this as well. The other things that come with this when I bought it, which is really great, because a long time ago, in 2013, when I started working with my myofascial uh, therapist and acupuncturist, um, she had me go and buy um, a squishy plastic ball, just like a ball you would throw for a dog or something. It wasn't spiky like this just imagine if it's squishy and what she had me do not just the myofascial stretches from the inside of the mouth going outwards um but i would use a little ball around my neck so she would she would put it right here and she would pull down very slowly and then kind of really aggressively and then i'd have to hold that stretch where I'm pulling, what's happening is I'm pulling down the tissue here in my neck and I'm pulling it with this ball because the ball serves as a better grip, she said, than the hand. Sometimes it can really get into deep tissues. So it's like if you're using the ball and you're using that to anchor onto the tissue and, and to stretch it out a little. So it's like whenever you have any tissue around your upper body, this really helps. Um, also, as far as like, if you get massage balls as well, those really help with neck, neck tension as well. Um, the same well as this one. I really like this one for the back of the neck. Um, and especially this one for the back of the neck too. Because you can go back there. And I find that I have the most amount of tension. Um, yeah, right in the back of my neck here. And then um, sometimes I just, you know, I have to do stretches where I lean back a lot. Um, so I don't know how to explain that, but yeah, you want to, um, and sometimes I, I used to in the past get zingers in the back of my neck really badly, which are like nerve, nerve pain, nerve shooting. Um, but as I did, uh, chiropractic work and also the myofascial, uh, release therapy, um, that really helped. I don't know what happened, but it really helped. And also I used a, um, what's it called? Ugh. It's like a cervical, I have it on my blog, but it's like a cervical pillow thing that fills with air and it keeps the weight of your head, your neck, or your head off your, your neck. So it's, it looks like one of those airplane pillows that you put around your neck, um, but it fills with air and you pump it up. And so it, it lifts your, it allows your um, neck to rest. So if you have cervical distension, that can really help. Or if you have a lot of tension in your neck, it can help because any type of time, you, the main thing with my recovery, I feel like the more you can relieve the tension around your body and the more you're focused on how dystonia affects you outside of your plane, the more it's going to improve your actual plane. Because a lot of it um, is not like, how do I say this? It almost seem ba seems backwards. It's not so much plane related first that you have to start with. You have to start farther back. So think of like... Uh, Think of uh, like micro view and macro view. So macro view, you want to take a bigger macro view assessment of your body, of what's going on in the outside, what's going on with your body um, outside of playing. So um, that helped a lot too. The other thing is like when I'm prepping, so after I'll do all my stretches, um, I'll go ahead and uh, I also do stretches where I just blow air in my cheeks. And I just kind of stretch it around. Again, I rub my cheeks as well, and I go all the way back. I find that I have the most amount of tension um, in the back of my jaw here. Like, right back here. Right on the corner of my backbone here. Or, I don't know what to call that, back of the jawbone. The other areas that I have really big tension is right under here, right under the jaw joint. 
if you stick your thumb right here and lift up, that's going to lead into your jaw joint or the bottom of your jaw joint. And I have the most amount of tension there and then right here next to my eye where there's nerve pain sometimes or there used to be nerve pain, I should say. Um, so yeah, the other thing that helps too is like um, when I see this imbalance where things are kind of moving this way a lot being pulled this way a lot that's my sign like my muscles you see how they're pulling this way a lot when i talk i i practice in a mirror talking or like moving my muscles over on this side to kind of balance it out a little just so i remind my body like hey this is imbalanced and so i did this over a period of time and i also do that when i play my horn i'll show you here too how i do that but uh the main thing is if i see this too stretched over this side or i feel too much tension pulling this side of my over to this side of the face I, I take that as a cue i need to pace myself more i need to relax more so i always follow my body and listen to my body so if there's too much tension uh from the dystonia or i'm overworking myself too much because it's in the beginning it's really hard to tell because it's like you lack the sensory you lack this it's like you're dealing with so much going on so that's why it's so important to get past the the psychological obstacles first because if you're so focused on like oh i sound bad I don't like the way I sound, this is horrible, I can't do this, I hate this, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm, I'm grieving, I'm... If you can't get your mind off that and get it focused on your body, then how are you going to, um, you know, even start addressing, um, addressing, even taking the first step to lead to recovery? Because it's a very long process, um, at least it was for me. Um, and it's always like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And so it's just very um, frustrating. So it's like if you can't handle um, these, this ebb and flow, because it's extreme ebb and flow, it will seem like in the first, like in the first couple of years, it was really extreme. It's like one day I could play and the next I couldn't. And one day I could play and then a week I couldn't play. And then another week I could play. And then I got better, like way better. I'd have like a huge, um, learning curve as far as um, recovery growth and then it would just all of a sudden go down so it was like you know if you had one of those graph charts it would just be all other places just be like up down up up down up down up and then down um so it's just very there's no like linearness to it so if you're not in the right mental space it's like you can't really start being in the place where you can embrace this kind of mind body awareness um so yeah, when I when I focus on the tension in my body, again, that's going to be the main thing, addressing the tension. And again, it's not um, that you're creating tension through bad playing habits. That's not it at all. That's the other reason why I haven't talked about this a lot, because people perceive it as, oh, I'm just doing a bad habit. It's not a bad habit. The tension is a byproduct of the dystonia. So it's a byproduct of those muscles fighting. It has nothing to do with you doing anything wrong. So... Um, also when I, I, and sorry I'm going all over the place you guys, it's because I didn't write this out or write an outline of what I wanted to say, so I'm just kind of ad-libbing. Um, so also what which helps with um, massaging the face, which I never used before, is one of these facial, I don't know what they're called, like facial beauty bar roller things, I don't know. I guess people are supposed to use this to look younger, <laughs> but little do they know, it was actually made for a focal system. Or brass musicians <laughs> or musicians wind players and then this side too I like this little one because you can get really deep into the um, into the joint area here back here and um, I especially have a lot of tension under here too surprisingly like right here so you'll also notice like I noticed um, when because there was a couple years where I wasn't playing my horn that much, especially when I was going to grad school or when I was um, teaching, I wasn't playing too much. And I actually noticed because I wasn't playing, my face got slimmer because I wasn't having all this bulkiness in my cheeks and I also wasn't having this um, swelling going on. So um, I noticed like as I started to play more that the muscles because they would get tense so tense so easily because all of a sudden they just be like flare up um so that's the other thing is i think what helped me with breaking that signal of like because what happens how do i explain oh my gosh too much going through my mind but um what happens is 
So they say when the brain is used to body pain or used to certain um, body reactions to things, because, for example, um, how do I say this? Let's say somebody was in a car accident, they injured their face, and the right side of their face um, would get swollen for a long time whenever they went to chew food or something. They'd go to chew food and it would swell up on the side because their jaw joint was like, I can't handle this, this hurts. But because they had to eat food and they had to keep using that jaw joint, the body got used to sending that signal every time they went to eat the food of like, okay, we're gonna have to send uh, some type of help to the jaw joint area to um, help it recover. So it would automatically just flare up. Even when they got to the point where there was no more, um, when it was all healed, let's say their face healed completely, and they shouldn't have any more pain back there, they shouldn't have any more flaring up. But what's happening is the brain is still sending that signal because it just associates it with that. So, and there, there's some research on that where they're saying like, yeah, sometimes what happens is the body um, captures this memory of trauma. It captures this memory of, of consistently sending the signal of like, oh, I need to help. Um, so that's what happens sometimes with, with, what do they call it? Like, what is it called? It's like when you still have pain in an area where there shouldn't be pain after you've recovered. So it's like that. It's like, um, so when I would go to play, I would get swollen. Even if I, I was, you know, my dystonia was way better. I'd be like, why am I getting swollen? Like I barely played a note and I didn't do anything wrong. Like I played for like two minutes, literally today. It could be like, I, this is how bad it was. It's like, I go to buzz in my mouthpiece. I'd just be like, for like five minutes and I'd be like that's all I'm doing today and then I get swollen and I was like this has to be something else so at the time back then I went to see like a neurodentist dentist um and but it wasn't anything to do it wasn't like I had an infection or anything going on like that um, so I knew, and he, he said, well, we, we should try the TENS unit because um, for some reason, when you go to play, this side of your face just automatically bulks up. It like tenses up. And he said, and I think what's happening is the signal that's being sent to that area, the signal that's being sent to that area is used to having to, to bulk up to help protect your jaw joint or something. He said, what TENS unit does is it sends an electric current. It's an electrode that you put on your face, electrodes, and it's hooked up to a, a box and it sends electric signals. Um, but in the dentist's office, they have this really fancy chair that does it. <laughs> so anyways, it sends the signals and what the signal does is it blocks that signal of, okay, you need to send um, pain to this area. So that way it allows the body to release that need to send overly flare up and overly do things to help you. So that way your tissues actually have a chance, a chance to rebuild a normal way, to build a normal way. So you can get also get used to moving that area without it flaring up or overdoing it. So I started doing TENS unit back then and I eventually bought my own one to take home with me and I used that and thanks to another friend too that has dystonia she let me hers for a while and then I eventually bought my own and that really helped me too because I was dealing with a lot of like residual pain at the time and I was really worried that I was getting uh, TMJ or something from like practicing but they were like realistically you're not you know I wasn't practicing that much <laughs> So there was no reason for it to happen. And surprisingly enough, it, he proved me right because after I used the TENS unit for like two, you know, two years, I think it was two years that I used it in combination with, I bought some Tremor, uh, Miracle or Tremor supplements. That's the other thing. If you don't want to buy collagen or you can buy collagen, but you can also buy like joint, joint tissue supplements. Um, you can buy like arthritis supplements, um, different, try different various things that help your body. I have a thing on my blog also that goes over supplements and things that you can try, um, alternative medicines. 
Um, but not giving advice here, not giving professional advice, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but anyways, um, I bought Tremor Miracle because I thought, well, maybe doing the TENS unit and taking the Tremor supplement will help me to relieve my body from this need to overly do things. So I was taking it in combination, and I found it really helped. It really boosted me throughout uh, throughout the year, and I got really good. I got really good, where the, all of a sudden, I wasn't getting swollen up all the time when I went to play. I wasn't feeling as much tension. Um, I was having a little bit more spasms, but the tension was gone, and that was the main thing that I needed to get past, was the tension, because it's like, um, Yes, the spasms are bad, but if you start to, you'll notice if you try to recover, you try to play, the more you play, the, it, there's, there's something that happens after the spasms. It's like you're fighting the spasms, and then as a result of that, you start to feel really like, oh my gosh, my muscles are just like, Ugh. So it's like, you have to find a way to address that. So again, like when I say with the, with the prep work and the aftercare work, um, that's really important. The things you do outside of the plane is really important. So I would do um, the stretches and massages. I also have this ice roller here that I recently bought. I used to use just a normal ice pack and heat pack. You can use that too, but the ice roller is kind of nice because you can just use it on your face um, after you're done playing. So, oh, sorry. It just melted a lot. So I just got my face wet. It feels like a dog just licked my face. Um, Anyways, um, yeah, the aftercare was just as important. So after I got done playing, so before I played, I did all these stretches, I took these supplements, um, I worked on my upper body muscles. So it's a lot of body work, a lot of body work. Um, and as soon as I did that, I would go and do my prep work on my horn, which is a whole different set of things, which I'll show you a little bit of here. Whole different set of things, but um, after I got done playing, let's say I only played 20 minutes that day, I still would have to do like 15, 20 minutes. Like let's say it's earlier in recovery, 15 to 20 minutes is all I could do if I was lucky. I would still have to go and do uh, do self-care afterwards. So self-care meant, um, how do I say this? In the past, in the beginning I would just do stretches, but then when I found the TENS unit, I would do TENS unit after I got done playing. I go home, I do TENS unit for like 30 minutes. Um, and then on top of that, I would do the myofascial release, um, which really helped me a lot. And then just stretches again. Um, but eventually, eventually I realized that, yeah, I needed to alternate ice packing and heat packing too, to help things. And then not only the alternating between the ice and heat packing, but then I found another thing that ended up helping me more than all of that, um, which is what I do now. So what I do now after I'm done playing is yes, I, I ice and heat pack. I, I ice pack, well, first, how do I say this? Okay, first I ice pack for however long I need to. And again, you really wanna feel your body, you wanna feel, cause you don't wanna overdo it, but you just feel, when I'm doing this and I'm massaging my face, what I'm looking for is that feeling of, of like, does this feel good? Does this feel like it's helping? Does it feel, can I feel, like really tuning into your body, does it feel like things are releasing? Does it feel like my body feels, my face feels better than it did 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago? Um, so I do that. And so I'll, I'll ice pack first. After done ice packing, um, before I go to bed, um, because it's a good time to do it when you brush your teeth, is all swish castor oil. <laughs> this big jug here, castor oil. And <laughs> I know I have like a lifetime supply of it. I really don't need that much, you know? But the, the thing is, um, and you don't have to use castor oil, you can use um, like coconut oil, because people do this, um, it's called oil pulling. And that's when people, um, instead of using like mouthwash, they'll use like coconut oil or something because they say what happens is the, the oil, it collects all the dirty stuff in your mouth and, and the oil kind of separates it from your teeth and it really gets in there and then you can spit it out and then brush your teeth and stuff and you have this minty breath from using coconut oil. Well, I accidentally bought um, castor oil but I looked up online and actually castor oil is really good if you are having TMJ because I've read about, I read a bunch of articles on how 
um, people who are suffering from TMJ or like swelling in their face or, or recovering from some type of facial trauma, if they use castor oil, and people would go through all lengths to use it, like they would um, soak like towels or something in it and just put it along their jaw here or wrap it around their head and just um, let it soak into the skin or the jaw joint. And I was like, why don't they just swish it like in their mouth? because you can kind of get it back there a little bit. And I said, plus it's better to have the um, tissue on the inside is more, because I don't know, because of the membrane or something, it's, it's, it affects it, it's more easy to dress it on the inside than the outside. So I, I looked into it and I, and I saw that you could do oil pulling with castor oil, even though it doesn't taste that great, but it's not bad at all. Um, and so I would switch castor oil, and castor oil is also one of the oils where it's really highly known for inflammation, reducing inflammation, and also helping with um, lots of ailments. And so I was really surprised, I was like, I wonder if I use castor oil if that will help me. So I started, and what I do is just two tablespoons of it, because I do it for 30 minutes. Sometimes I do it an hour if I feel really tense, I'll do it for an hour. But it really relaxes the muscles. I mean, if you have been having any type of tension problems in your face, please try try castor oil. Try it for at least a month or two, at least two months, um, and see how it affects you. Um, the other thing is that at first it was so cool because it would automatically like just, I wouldn't even have to use my TENS unit. I wouldn't have to use um, the ice pack or the heat pack. I could just use castor oil and it would just, even 30 minutes of it, I would just be like, wow, okay. I'm, I can play, um, but over time as, as I started to recover more and recover more, um, actually it's become so strong that I can only use it, I can only switch it for a little bit now because I, I now it's like it, my muscles have become so, I don't know what it does, but it's, they're so highly affected by the castor oil that if I switch it for a couple of minutes, now it's like they're too relaxed. So I have to pace myself, but it's really strong, it really helps, and so I've stopped having inflammation, but I still do this on relapse days, so I still do the castor oil on relapse days and the ice packing and stuff, but there are some weeks now where I can go without having to do this amount of self-care. What I can do is I can just massage my face with this and do some facial stretches and just um, a tiny bit of myofascial release, and then I'm done. I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'm good for the rest of the week. Um, because again, I'm so aware of my body, I know exactly what it needs. And then when I have those heavy relapse um, days, I have to do this whole routine. So again, it, it has to do with the prep work and the aftercare work. Um, so uh, that's basically what helps me right now. Um, so right now, I primarily rely on, you know, taking my collagen, my vitamins, um, doing, addressing specific, because now I know where there's specifically tense areas when I wake up. I'm like, okay. I need to stretch my neck for sure, for sure today. Um, or I know that I have to do myofascial release. I'm like, oh, I really feel it in my face today. I really feel it in my jaw today. So now I have to do jaw stretches. Or So it's like I know exactly what I need to focus on more than the others. So I might be like, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, five minutes doing jaw stretches rather than, um, you know, or I'm going to do 10 minutes of jaw stretches rather than 10 minutes of, you um, of neck stretches or of uh, of like tongue stretches, so it's like I can tell where where I'm that tense. I also do. Um, I know this sounds weird, but I do like tongue massage also because I feel like in the back of the tongue, I have it in the back of the tongue. It's like really meaty, um, and so if I squish it and I hold it in, it reduces the tension in the tongue. Because I don't, I don't know. Well, I know some of you have troubles with tonguing with your dystonia and actually for me my dystonia affects my tongue too um i definitely feel the tension in my tongue especially in the back of it for some reason even though that's not like really an area you would think would affect your playing but it really helps like if i if i massage it or i squeeze it and I hold it um because i noticed when i started doing tongue stretches and you can look them up online what are tongue stretches i can do um I noticed how, especially if I was having a relapse day, where um, I started to kind of tumble over my words uh, when I was speaking, um, I would do tongue stretches and that would really improve my speech. I'd be like, okay, 
yeah this feels better this feels way better so you know this dystonia affects a lot more uh, of our body than we realize um and even in in the tongue though it doesn't carry over to my speech all the time um it's just only on really 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 bad relapses which is like every blue moon it's only like once a year where i feel like my tongue is just like okay what the heck i can't speak today it's ridiculous um but um yeah so just being open to exploring your upper body um exploring tuning into it really becoming a friend with it tuning into it with this mindfulness again mindfulness you can't be in a state of like judging yourself uh, again you have to think of this as a, as a recovery not as a playing thing you have to think of it as something to do with your body and your brain rather than your playing you can't place the blame on yourself you have to think of it now scientifically you have to think of it objectively you have to think of it objectively yes objectively because the physical work if you're too tied up in the emotional work um and you can't get to a place where you're able to look at your plane objectively or look at your body objectively or look at everything that's going on objectively and separate it into kind of viewing it in various ways um or in the many layers and and also having hope at the same it's just a very having a focal dystonia is so difficult because there's so many layers to it so many layers but the psychological side is the most difficult for people and i think that's what kind of prohibits people from recovering not that i'm saying um you know some people's symptoms are more severe or it affects them in different areas that you know they just know that it's like have heavily affected in a certain area where it's not going to allow them to to play you know or they know that it's the recovery is like going to be really difficult um but for the majority for the majority who don't have it that badly and have a chance at recovery uh, a lot of them get set back in the psychological stuff not just dismiss that because um again after you get hit with any type of trauma or setback or anything in life you have to go through the psychological work and when it comes to being a musician that's so difficult because all of a sudden you're dealing with the having to remove your self-identity to break down the ego you have to remove the ego from the process which is really difficult because when you tie associate music with um with who you are and you, you you're playing you you feel like it defines your worthiness and you feel like it defines your your career and your recognition and and ties in everything and then you lose the music community you lose your friends you lose that access to that community it's just all kinds of layers of things that are really hard to deal with um and most importantly being able to hear your own voice and express yourself through your primary instrument um and it's really hard to hear people say like you know well can't you just switch instruments why don't you just switch careers just do this do that it's like you know if would you handle the same way somebody told you to do that, do that on your instrument no it's like <laughs> am i just a uh, potato <laughs> can i just be thrown around <laughs> but anyways i'm getting off track but um yes it's very difficult but anyways getting back on track um, when I moved to my plane, this is becoming a long video, <laughs> longer than I thought. Um, when I moved to my plane, and this is at my current stage, so not talking about onset, not talking about like the first couple of years of playing where you can't get a sound out. So this pertains to my playing abilities right now. So the first thing I do when I am warming up after I, after I did all my stretches earlier in the day, cause I do that all right away in the morning or at least try to, or throughout the day. And I did all the prep work. Now, when I go to warm up. I do a lot of breathing and buzzing um, and I do stretches if I have to on my mouthpiece. So um, the first thing is that you want to make sure when you're at uh, when you are still able to play, um, you know, to uh, how do I say this? Like if you're 70, 70, 90 percent range of recovery, you, you want to make sure that you don't lose your air. You don't lose your ability to focus on air because uh, um, it's really easy to 
let that go. Now, that doesn't pertain to the other stages for me because in the other stages, I had to be really experimental with my air. I had to be very like mixing it up and stuff because your my embouchure just couldn't handle different ways of air capacity <laughs> flowing through it, if that makes sense. But um, now, now that I'm like at 85%, I can really heavily begin to get my air going again. Um, and I have to remember that because I haven't been, when you're not used to practicing it that heavily, you lose track of it. And what really helps me currently is actually, um, I watched a video and I should tag him in it, is David Vining. I watched a video of him, I think on, on a website where he was showing this um, exercise where it's like you're just breathing and blowing and breathing and blowing into your mouthpiece. And um, this has helped me a lot. So you're just going and you're just letting everything loose. And before in the past, I always say, you know, in the beginning stages, I did this too, actually, in the very beginning, especially when it came to addressing the mouthpiece. Yeah. So I was doing this before in the past on my mouthpiece, but when I watched the video, how David applied it to his instrument, it was like, wow, how come I didn't apply that to my instrument? Um, so I'll show you it here. But anyways, I'm just letting everything loose. And you're just, the main thing, <coughs> oh my gosh, sorry you guys, I'm just getting over a cold. <coughs> so I might not have the best breathing technique today. <coughs> but the main thing is like when, I, when I'm blowing out the air, I'm not focused on air methods. I'm not like, am I taking in enough air? Am I blowing it out enough air? Am I using a syllable? Am I tonguing? Am I initiating attack? Am I... Um, Am I, you know, doing it in time? You're not gonna think about that. We're not thinking about breathing technique. What we're th focused on is the passing of the air through the lips as they're relaxed and just letting it go, just letting it go and not thinking about time. So another way you can practice this is because with focal dystonia, what tends to happen, especially in the beginning, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the beginning stages. The beginning stages is you go up to play and you go to blow and your brain goes into I'm going to playing mode. But when that happens, um, your dystonia automatically responses and freaks out. So you might even have tremors as soon as you get up to here. You could be just holding something right here and you can feel as you start to form your embouchure, almost in slow motion, you feel it start to just, yeah. And you're like, I can't even get it on my face. I can't, I can hold it here and I can feel, so people will say I'm holding it on my face, not even blowing, and I can feel the spasms. So, but when you're later on, you're reco more recovered like I am, it's, that's not an issue. That's not an issue. But what is the issue you still want to address? You still want to focus on this passing of the air through the lips loosely because you want, still want to remind the body that, um, now it has come from a place of relaxation. Not, not so much relaxation, but um, how do I say this? Yes, relaxation at first, because you want to put the body in, in, in a way where it's relaxed at first. Because again, the body doesn't remember, it doesn't remember how things are supposed to go. So when you didn't have focal dystonia and you would go to warm up, you would be like, oh yeah, everything is like really relaxed. And as I'm warming up, my muscles are starting to get a little worked out. And now I feel them kind of grasping things better. I start to practice and I, I, I fix a passage and it's fixed. I fix a note that I missed and it's fixed. But with dystonia, it's like the body doesn't remember that process. So when you go to blow air in the mouthpiece, it's like, wait, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to like really tense up? Like we're gonna play now? Like you want me to be like, like tensing up? Or do you want me to just like be confused and not know what to do? So you want to remind it of the process of how things go or how, at least that's what worked for me. So the blowing the loose air first. So it's like, I'm going through this process. So I'm gonna be blowing loose air. I'm going to be, um, focusing on this kind of like relaxation and just letting it go and just being mindful and not really, um, of course, not judging yourself. But then 
you'll see I'm gonna also switch to the mode where it's like it's almost like on manual mode it's like manual it's like you have to manually do everything so then I'm gonna switch to where I start buzzing and I'm starting to allow my my muscles to take over so it's like I'm going from a place of relaxation and then breaking my way into letting the muscles take over and function rather before in the past it was like the muscles would just fight and try to take all the control and say wait you gotta lend it over to me for a little bit okay I don't know if that makes sense um so yeah just really loosely and in the beginning uh what really helped me like in the beginning stages when I was doing this of course I couldn't keep it on my face is you that's why a lot of practitioners will use like an inanimate object so they might use um like a pen or a fork or a spoon or something or a wind windmill and what you do is you just you bring it closer but sometimes this reminds the brain so much of the instrument it starts to kick in so you want to start off with an object <laughs> that that doesn't um, kick that brain signals kicking in because the this dystonia sends a brain signal that is messed up sends a brain signal that isn't wired to work isn't it's where it's it's misfiring so when it's misfiring you want to tr in the beginning stages you're tricking the brain it's more like you're tricking the brain you're trying to find ways to trick the brain and it's kind of like what um uh it's kind of like um, when I was doing that interview, uh, I can't remember with who, but they were saying like, you know, it's like, the stone is kind of like when you go to get the mail out of the mailbox and there's this dog that's barking, it's chasing after you. And it's like, so you have to learn your way to get past the dog. Um, so you trick it one day, but then it picks up on what you're doing and it follows you to wherever you're at in the other place you know, how you're getting in, delivering the mail the other way. Um, and then you move to another corner and try to deliver mail that way, but then the dog eventually picks up and it moves over there. So dystonia is like that. It's like in the beginning stages for, for that's the most frustrating part. That's why I say it's always two steps forward, one step back, because it's like, you'll improve, and then I'll study and your dystonia will catch on. The brain will be like, wait, I know what you're doing, but I already have a brain pathway for that, that we've worked on for like 20 years. Why aren't we using this? And then you have to trick it again and say like, no. So it's like you're breaking down this, to try to break down your brain's perception of what you're doing is really difficult. <laughs> Especially in the beginning stages, it's so difficult. So when you start off, you want to use an inanimate object, um, maybe not the mouthpiece, um, maybe a pen or a windmill or anything. It could be, um, it could be like a, a camera button, <laughs> camera button thing. And you just, <sighs> that's why visualizations really help me. Like people think it's really ridiculous. They're like, really? You just envision blowing on hot coffee or, or hot cocoa? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. And that's what helped me to be able to get this back on my face. Cause I just imagined I was blowing on a candle or, cause when you think about it, Again, I'm going off track again here. And I've said this before in videos. When you think about it, about it, about it, oh gosh. When you ask a child to blow out a candle, what do they do? They go, <sighs> you see how they puff their cheeks? They don't think about it. So it's like you're trying to get to this place where you're tricking the brain and you're saying, listen, we're blowing on a candle. So it says, the brain's like, oh, we're learning something new. It doesn't go straight to the, I'm playing the horn. It goes to, oh, we're learning something new. Or, oh, we're blowing on a candle. Oh, we're doing something that doesn't matter. We're doing something that doesn't require really highly refined skills. 20 years worth of highly refined skill work. It doesn't require that. And it'll say, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. And then you go, <sighs> And eventually when you're able to, and so I imagine blowing on hot cocoa or yeah, let's say a candle or something. <sighs> 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 a 
And when are you able to get to that stage where you're just able to do that without thinking about playing your horn or worrying about how you'll sound or worrying about what's going to come out? You're good. You're doing good. Um, so yeah, I get to this point where I would and then I just try to buzz something out of it. So another trick that I did, which I, I taught my elementary kids, was to blow on the back of your hand, make a raspberry, like the, the farting noise, and then switch to the mouthpiece. So it's like I'm switching between two objects. I know that seems crazy, but switching between two inanimate an inanimate object in the mouthpiece so that my brain is disengaging and it doesn't have time to think like oh you're blowing into the horn or this or that so the whole, whole first of part of rehabilitation was tricking the brain constantly getting it back on the route of we're learning something new because when you're learning something new which is the same as another pathway that's already been built and brain pathway um, it's really hard to get your brain to not want to fall into the old route. Because like they said, the neural pathway, when it's dug, it's like if somebody dug deep into the ground, that channel, like let's say they dug a channel in the ground where water flows through, that channel is deep. And so if you're trying to not use that channel, it's almost impossible. If you're trying to dig another channel for the water to go down, it's very, very difficult because it'll automatically want to go down the channel that you've dug for 20 years, that it's been going down for 20 years. It doesn't want to go down the other one. So it's going to constantly try to fail you. It's going to constantly try to get you to go back on the same way of doing things. So it is a lot of like imagination. You have to use a lot of imagination, a lot of exploration, a lot of visualization, a lot of feeling your body, a lot of feeling things out. A lot of adaptations a lot of moving things around constantly until at some point what happens is the brain um, at some point my brain was like oh okay I finally get it I finally get it you're learning something new you're learning something new so I didn't have to constantly go through this whole like okay let's try to it's like tricking a toddler like okay like you know a toddler doesn't want to leave um you say get in the car and they're like i don't want to go and they're like okay we're leaving without you and they're like wait i want to come along so it's like you're constantly tricking <laughs> i didn't have to trick my brain anymore um so yeah anyways at this stage back to, on track at this stage the blowing the air you just want to make any sound without judgment so <sighs> <sighs> see i'm puffing my cheeks but now i don't puff my cheeks anymore <coughs> it goes straight to normal playing now the other thing that you want to be aware of when you're when I'm or that I'm aware of when I'm buzzing or playing my horn. Sorry, I'm trying to get my light on here. I don't have that much light. Um, when I go start buzzing or playing my horn, I notice that my symptoms are affected as I'm going up and down, so like ascending, descending, but also um, how do I say this? So there's two things. How does the dystonia affect your playing abilities, like motion-wise, like going up and down in your plane? And how does it affect your embouchure um, physically? Like, not just spasms. So for example, um, you might notice as you're buzzing up and down, again, it's affected more in the mid to low register. It's a little more difficult. Um, the other thing is the noticing how your embouchure is affected. So I don't have spasms really right now. We'll see if that changes when I move to the horn, but I don't have spasms. But I might notice that I've noticed two things happen with my embouchure. One, my muscles either have a tendency to want to, like when the brain signal is sent, there's some days where my muscles 
feel so tense in like let's say this how do I say this okay sometimes my muscles if I want to go like this and contract like pull my lips in I'll start to feel a resistance to that I'll start to feel um, like instead they try to do the opposite because they don't want to do that they're like no I don't like this so they'll start to overly pucker they'll start to go the opposite direction so let's say I, I, I'm going to play and I'll feel my muscles want to overly pucker because they they're tense in that direction. So how do I say this? It's either it's overly puckering, there's over over excessive puckering, or there's over excessive like smiling going on, like stretching in the face. And that signals two things to me. Either one, there's too much, te there's stretching that needs to be addressed right here in the zygomatic muscles, or two, in the corners. So I address both. So what I do is So what I do when I'm, and this only happens when I'm buzzing or I'm playing, I notice this. This is where the excessiveness comes in. So I will buzz, but then because it wants to overly pucker, I'll go ahead and form that into a stretch. I'll let it over pucker. I'll go to the extreme for it. So for example, this, and I'm gonna look really silly. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna look ridiculous, but just bear with me. <laughs> You see how I'm like I'm like even getting to the point where I'm like like so I'm stretching out that pucker as far as I can and you don't have to buzz while you're doing I do both buzzing while I'm doing it and just doing it still and you can do it without the mouthpiece on the face and then again with the, with the over excessive like corners like going wonky when I feel like they're doing that and I'll just go ahead and dress both because why not? Um, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, so let's say I'm buzzing up and down. And I notice in a certain register, my corners are like really like, oh my gosh, I feel like I have dystonia heavily when I'm playing right there. So I'll go ahead and, but I'm like, oh, it's in my corners. It's like really, so again, it's like you're taking assessment of, is it over excessive puckering? Is it over excessive smiling? Is it, is it something I need to address back here that I feel like tension? Is it my jaw that I need to do more work on? Do I need to work more on releasing the tension in my jaw? Do I need to release more tension in my neck? Where is it residing? Where is it residing from? So it's like you're being really highly aware of where is it residing from and you're addressing that tension because the more you're breaking down the tension, the the more it's going to allow you to find that leeway in working between um, a collapsed and an overly excessive worked embouchure, if that makes sense. So the, the smile, the stretch corners, I'll go ahead and do that one. So let's say I go to play and this is what happens. You see how they started? So I'm just going to go ahead and stretch that. I'm going to let it do that. But I'm going to do it really, I'm going to stretch it. So again, I'm going to look ridiculous. So I'm a little embarrassed, so I'm just doing it with my hands over my face. So I'm doing that. And also there will be other areas of your face that you'll feel when you're playing or you're buzzing that need these stretches. So you might feel like, oh wow, my chin is, and this is very odd in, because I feel like for me and like um, 
you know, like they say that most high breast players are affected in their lower lip control and low breasts are more affected in their upper lip control of focal dystonia. The lower lip control, for a long time in the beginning, I would feel the focal dystonia in my chin area like really badly, really badly. So I'd have to like really massage my chin a lot. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it just felt like this was just really crazy. Um, also, how I stretched my chin muscles was, so yeah, just rubbing, because the chin muscles are so tough, the metallus here, the metallus muscle, it's like, I would also frown to get down into my chin muscles, so I'm going to look re really silly again. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, so you just want to kind of frown, like Piddles the Clown. I've never watched that, but I've heard of it. But yeah, you just want to really frown. And get down into those chin muscles. You would stretch your... So it's experimenting with all these facial expressions to stretch out these areas of tension. So wherever you feel tension, you want to address that because it's going to allow you to more leeway to work on your plane without overworking your muscles or setting in your brain like, okay, we need to fight. It just makes the fighting of the muscles less intense because... Um, the more you're able to kind of like get those muscles to stop fighting or, or like a little bit more control over them while they're fighting, the more you're going to find that middle ground, that leeway. So I, I, fall, I call it leeway or um, what I call it on my blog. Oh my gosh, I forgot what I even titled it, what I named it. Um, but anyways, yeah. So this video is going on really long. I'm going to go ahead and move on to my horn. But yeah, I'll do all these stretches. <laughs> While also using lots of air. <clears throat> okay. Then once I move into the horn, I do the exact same thing. I do the exact same thing. So, um, one of the things that helps me now is if I set my lower lip first, because again, I lack the lower lip control. So, I tend to set more of my lower lip and then go upper. So, I'll go. I'll sit on my lower lip, bring it to my face. Now, I can kind of feel out where I need to go a little bit. I still stutter on my first initial attack but then after that I can hold out pitches I can play a passage or something but as that is that very first like initial attack but that doesn't concern me because I'm just happy that there's no spasms or anything afterwards so I'm very happy with this um, so did you notice how like so when I was blowing air So I practice two things. So I do the relaxed one. Then I set my lower lip and I try the more like, cause now I can set, I can set. I know I can set without causing problems. And then I try to make a sound. Um, and again, I'm not caring about whether I miss a note or if it's shaky or whatever. But I am, because now my sensory does pick up on, like, okay, this is how I can adjust or where I need to move a little. I get a little sense, like, it's almost like a far distant, like, whisper. I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> it's like a whisper, kind of far off the distance. It's like, I, but it's like my sensory. It's like, move over here. Because you know when you go to play and you miss a note, you can, like, tilt it. It's like your body automatically knows what to do, but with focal dystonia, it doesn't. So it's like, for a long time, you're just kind of guessing. 
but as you improve over time that sensory gets a little closer to you and you and, and I, I I put it in terms outside my body it's like okay it's way out there I can't feel it but as it moves closer all of a sudden I'm like okay I sense it I can feel right here I can feel the sense that I need to move it a little over here or like tilt it this way just a little bit and then I try it and see if it works so it's like my body is slowly picking up on adaptation I don't know if that makes sense and again if you're in the beginning stages and you're trying to move on to your horn like I showed him some of my other videos, I would. It took me a while to just learn how to blow air through my lips against an inanimate object, then put it on my face, then buzz, and then when I moved from buzzing, I moved to placing it in my horn. And before I had like a burp, which was like a little attachment you can put here and put your mouthpiece on the side here. So I would practice like blowing on that and then or you can just tape it on there but you don't want it in the receiver um, first and then as soon as you get used to because again it has to deal with the brain's perception so you're putting it on there or you could tie an inanimate object on here like a feather or something <laughs> and blow on it and then try putting it in the mouthpiece receiver and hold on to it the same way. And again, the visualizations really helped me in the beginning. But anyways, now at these stages, you can see that I'm more doing more setting. But you see my setting, my lower, when I blow, when I play actually, you see so much air in my, in my chin area. There's so much air down here. My corners are there, but my chin, you can see that there's lots of air in there. There's also air up here. You guys probably can't tell, but there's air, a little bit of air moving up here, just a tiny bit. Uh, on the inside, there's air bubbles, but there's mainly air in my chin. And the reason why that is, is because, again, with, with focal embouchure dystonia, it's not about, you don't want to focus on having the perfect embouchure. You don't want to focus on embouchure form and technique. Like, I know people keep saying, like, oh, this is dangerous, like, you're gonna get hurt, like, you can't, you can't, um, you can't do that. You know, it's like, screw you. Like, do you have focal dystonia? Sorry. I'm being really mean, but I'm being so, I'm being mean today. I don't know what's going on. But, um, you, you, it's like, when you are injured, you can't be expected to do things the same way that you did them that were involved, not saying they were the result, not saying that they were the cause of your embouchure dystonia, but they're along the same pathway, that broken pathway. So you can't be expected to use the same pathway. So if it looks weird or it looks different or it looks strange, I'm, I'd say, wow, you're actually doing good. Because if I see somebody who has focal embouchure dystonia and they're playing with a really weird looking embouchure, but it sounds good, it doesn't hurt, it feels great, and they're still playing, it's like, um, have you seen that video of the, the, the two-fingered violinist, the one that um, he's playing the, I think it's the Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn maybe he's playing, but he's playing that whole uh, piece with the with two fingers, with this one and these two, two together, instead because he can't use his third finger. And so again, it's adaptation. So you see people with hand dystonia, like musicians with hand dystonia, some of them have to use adaptations. Some of them, you know, change something on their instrument to help them play or a modification in some way. And you can do some modifications with this. And I'll talk about that in a little bit in a second. I hope I remember. If I don't, remind me in the comments. But um, with the adaptation, you have to also adapt the way you move, the way you play. So you have to be very open to... You have to get out of that mindset of, I have to look this way, I have to sound this way, I have to play this way. You have to throw that all out the window and let it go. So, um, sorry, my, oh, my bangs. Um, <laughs> you want to, uh, you want to let it all go so that way you're just focused on letting things, 
you're tuned into your body you, again the mindful awareness you want to be in this mindset of of okay i'm more focused on what i can do what and, and figuring out what my body is telling me so yeah anyways back to this um yeah with the mod with you have to have a different pathway so to build up a different pathway we have to go outside the norm you have to go outside the norm um because if you try to do things the old way it's just going to lead you down the same path and your brain's going to be like wait i know exactly what you're doing so it's like you may develop a normal looking armature you know in the end in the near the end of your recovery but it has to be naturally done it has to be because the body naturally kicked in and started doing that normal movement you can't force it that's the other thing you can't force your embouchure to look a certain way you can't force yourself to sound a certain way you can't force yourself to do things a set traditional way you have to work on it through your own tuning into your body because your body's like hey listen to me i am affected in very individualistic ways by this and you need to pay attention because otherwise we're not going to be able to work through this um so really loving your body really tuning into it and really looking at things from explorative mindset like a child again if you think about it it took you like what from beginner stage to 20 years later to get to a point of being able to play at a high level ability now imagine yourself with an injury or a disability and having to do that all over again it's 10 times worse it's like not only am i older not only is my brain older <laughs> but i'm i'm starting from beyond beginner level i'm at disability level which is three times harder um so you have to think about it like okay if i want to get anywhere with this i can't go down the same pathway that i used before i have to do something different so that's what's worked for me so yeah with the with the embouchure so go ahead and look here things to test things out that you're maybe not noticing or, or aware of so the first thing is that I'm alternating between how my embouchure wants to set when I go to play and see if that works so it's naturally trying to set and I'm like no that doesn't work so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use more air air puff to initiate the note rather than set and then blow I'm gonna do it all at once I'm gonna blow the air out while it sets. I don't know if that makes sense. Because 
when I'm setting, my body's automatically setting. You see how it's like I'm ta I'm set it and then I'm taking it there and then I'm blowing out. Maybe I noticed that way doesn't work today. So I'm like, okay, I obviously have to use an air puff. I have to put the mouthpiece on my face and I have to use an air puff with a little bit of corners, just a little bit of corners and an air puff to get the sound out. <sighs> You can also use nose breaths too. So it's really experimenting with how can I initiate the sound? What way does it feel a little better? So really thinking outside the box. So as soon as I'm doing that, I realize which way is going to work for me the best way. So do I have to take a nose breath in order to get a sound out today? The first initiate initiating the first attack or to find that spot? Because I noticed it too, once I find which way works the best as far as breathing, whether it's a nose breath, setting and then breathing, or just using an air puff, or air attack to initiate things. Once I find which one works the best, then I can my body kind of kicks in and starts to find a setting. And then once I find that setting, I can play. I hope that makes sense. Again, it has to be very manual. So I have to also pick up on, do I need to change my setting in the lower register? Do I need to automatically manually like tilt or switch to a different side or lean towards one side? So like I showed in some of my other videos, when I go through assessment of my, of my experimenting of what works or not on my face, I call it an inventory. I'm like taking inventory of what works or doesn't work. So I've like, yes, is my is my is my mouth am i using the right mouthpiece am i using the right setting am i using like have i found the right setting um so what i do is i go through and um i try so for example and i do this with buzzy too this this more applies to the beginning stages but i i would go and i would say does it work easier if i set on my upper lip first So, does it work, or how about lower lip? <laughs> so, it's like a, a combination of things. So, I'm like, does the angle, like how I tilt the angle, does that affect things better, more or less? Is it more upper lip, more lower lip? Is it more to the left? Is it more to the right? Because again, you have to manually figure out where the best setting is for you. And especially in the beginning stage, it's hard because it's like, you can't feel it. So you have to test it out by hearing and seeing if, if it, or not seeing, but, or hearing, but sorry, scratch that. Um, you can tell once you found the spot, but you have to do more experimenting with it in the beginning stages. So it's like, is it more lower lip? Is it more upper lip? Is it more side to side? Is it, um, the angle that I have to adjust, could I have to play this way? Or do I have to play this way? Um, is the mouthpiece, does it have the mouthpiece have to be different? Um, do I have to use more pucker or more corners? Um, do I have to use, uh, what are the other ones? Um, 
I forgot. <laughs> but I did a whole video over it. I did a whole video over it and I wrote a whole thing over it too. But it's you're just going through and you're testing out what works and what doesn't work um, based on finding the setting. How to find the setting when you can't sense where it's at. Um, but you have to go, I ha in the beginning stages, I had to go through this almost every day of this testing, of this trying to figure out what works. And again, this is such mundane little things. These are such mundane, they seem like boring little things, things that you're like, I shouldn't have to take the time. I shouldn't have to spend, you know, two months or like every day trying to find what works and what doesn't. But the thing is, again, with the brain, it's like tricking it. It's again, with the brain, it's like the brain's not picking up on it. And so it's confused. So you want to teach it like, hey, we're doing this manually. We're doing something different. And once you, it realizes that, you're like, okay, I got to try and find a setting. But since I can't set, sense it and you can't sense it, the brain, I have to manually figure it out. So I would do things like, okay, if I move my jaw more forward, does that help? If I move it back, does it help? If I use more air in my lips, does it help? If I use less air in my lips, does it help? Does it help side to side? Does it help up and down? Um, um, even to modifications like does playing on my leg, is that easier than playing off the leg? Now I play off the leg. Before, for many years, I could only play on my leg. Um, does and little things matter when you have focal dystonia even the little things like where your pinky ring is adjusted even that it's like even the distance of the pinky ring is like affects you so you have to be very aware of of how all these little things affect you and take into account how can i i manually work my way through this by being aware of my body and dressing things experimenting exploring but also listening to my body at the same time so it's not about music and it's not recovery isn't about music isn't about the way you sound isn't about traditional like formation and practices of the embouchure or um especially not for me or um any of that and even the air again it's like peeling back layers of onion so different stages certain things that worked for you are not going to work in other stages they're going to vary again because the brain is going to constantly be fighting you and being like oh i see what you're doing let's go back to the the pathway that you dug for 20 years um you're saying no um okay now i gotta switch it up today but at some point it does kick in and it lets you take more control and have more leverage over exploring and being like okay this way works better and the body's like oh okay i get it i get it i get it after so like for me right now it takes like maybe five minutes five minutes to ten minutes of warming up for my embouchure to finally click and say my brain to say oh this is your setting. Okay, I got it. I got it. You were, you were good. We're good. You can play now. Um, so, but for a long time, it's like you're just manually having to figure out where it goes. said the excessive puckering in the past and the, or the like it's either excessive puckering excessive corner stretching or excessive collapsing you see that more in the mid to lower register the collapsing on the corners where you're just like i can't i can't they just can't go up at all um and that was more in the beginning stages for me um but when it does that again like i i do stretches so like before when i was doing the stretching while he's buzzing I also do that on the horn. So once I, if I feel, again, I'm always aware of my body and sensing um, where the tension is and um, trying to address it. So if I need to stretch while I'm playing, 
Like, let's say I have a, a five minute break or something in rehearsal. Let me see here if I can do it. I haven't done this in a while. Let's say I want to accept excessively pucker. So I'll just stretch it out. I know that looks really funny. Um, or the smiling. Let me see if I can figure out. So yeah, again, it's not about how you sound. You have to be not embarrassed of anything that comes out of your heart. And you have to change your thoughts and change your perception of, of sound. Even if you have to change it to objective view of it's just a frequency coming out of my instrument. I know that seems cold and harsh, but I think it's just air traveling through my instrument, a certain frequency that's being pushed out. Um, and it's just sound. It's sound. Sound is not good or bad. Sound is sound. Sound exists. Thank God I can hear. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it's a good or bad sound. Um, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that some things don't sound bad. But when it comes to your playing, you have to get used to seeing it as beautiful, even the ugly sounds. So sometimes what I like to do is just put down all three vowels and <laughs> my horn professor, one of my horn professors um, uh, made us do this in the studio once, um, which is so funny because um, he would make us play things on all one, two, and three just, just to um, get us used to playing in an uncomfortable zone, like stepping outside our comfort zone. Because when any of those who aren't horn players, when we push all three of those down on the F side of the horn, it's just really, the partials are so, like, so close. I mean, really close. So he tried to have us play a melody on that, and everybody just would hate it. They're just like, oh, God, why are you making us do this? <laughs> Sounds so bad. So sometimes, every now and then, I'll just press down one, two, and three, and I'll just go to town and just blurt out whatever I want. I'll even hold it up, you know, like, so you're just doing make as many bad sounds as you can and learn to love them uh one of the things that helped me was when I was teaching, which is one of the reasons I, I really am grateful for having to... Oh, oh God. Okay. Ran into my rose quartz thing. Um, but one of the... I'm like, I'm like petting my horn. Like, are you okay? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, one of the things I'm grateful for with teaching is that... Um, but my students um, really helped me learn was, you know, when you're, when you're teaching, um, sorry, I'm kind of rubbing back here because it's kind of sore here. But anyways, um, when you're teaching beginner, you know, band methods and you're teaching beginner, you know, kindergartners play violin or teaching, you know, students who are brand new instruments and, and they're just not used to not being able to get a sound out or anything. And you get used to being so proud of them when they're able to get a sound out when they can't. And then even if they don't sound that good, they're so proud, they're so happy, you know, just playing, they can learn three notes and yeah, they don't sound like a pro, but um, they're so happy. They're so happy when they're able to just get those three notes out and play hot crust buns or, or um, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb, they're just so excited to play that for you and play that for their family and play that for their friends. And they're just always so looking forward to it. And it's like you feed off that enthusiasm. And you're like, wow, I wish I could be like a kid again and think of my playing that way and be so proud of every sound that comes out of my instrument because I don't know any better. It's like, you know, like ignor ignorance is bliss. So you want to find a way to become um, ignorant to a sense 
towards your sound. Um, so one of the ways I did that was just affirmations. So uh, I know it sounds crazy, but talk into a mirror, um, say positive things to you, even talk to your horn, talk to your instrument, because it's your baby. <laughs> like literally, seriously, talk to it, tell it how you feel, um, have conversations with it. Um, but always, whenever you make bad sounds, what you consider bad sounds, say, like again, as teachers, they teach us, if you say something bad to a child, um, like if you, or if you say something to a child that, that gives up the impression, like they feel bad, like if they're like, oh, I'm a bad, I'm a bad kid, and they start crying. Um, like let's say you, you word, word something wrong, like you're like, you're like, you accidentally say like, I don't understand why you, you always keep messing up. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so bad. I'm a terrible child. And then you're supposed to say seven things, seven or 10 things, because it takes seven repetitive positive statements to block out that one negative experience. So it's the same with your playing. Um, if you're struggling with thinking about negative thoughts, you've got to start practicing um, saying positive things and repeating them um, whenever you catch yourself doing that. You got to repeat that positive statement over and over again. So the more you can say it out loud, the more you can get to the place where you can say it out loud and not think people think you're going crazy. It doesn't matter if they think you're going crazy. The more you can say it out loud in a mirror or to your instrument or, or to yourself um, or even write it down um, if you feel more comfortable doing that, uh, the more um, good you will feel about your playing and be able to accept just anything that comes out. So it, it is really difficult though, because if, if you are playing professionally still and you have vocal dystonia, I don't know how they do it because, um, I don't know how they do it with embouchure dystonia, um, because it's a little bit, I don't know, I, I guess I haven't gotten there yet and I haven't really met anybody that is still playing professionally with embouchure dystonia, like in a major orchestra <laughs> um, that isn't, doing Botox or some type of, um, who's recovered fully, but, um, I just, it's just, it's so psychologically challenging to get past that point of, of feeling like you're under pressure to have to sound good. So to get to a point where you feel good and you don't care what, about what other people think, that's, that's the goal. Um, so yeah. I, I hope that this helped a little bit and, and showed you guys kind of a little bit of what I do to kind of um, prepare and get ready. And, and again, with the, with the care afterwards, what I'll do is like, let's say I, let's say I just got done with a rehearsal for, for two hours, two hour, because our brass concert, we rehearse for at least two hours, sometimes hour, 30 minutes, but mainly two hours. Um, I go and I, I do my castor oil and I do my ice, my ice packing, ice and heat pack, and and then I'm done for the day. And sometimes every other day I'll, I'll do this and I'll, I'll, you know, massage my face and make things, sure things are okay. Um, the other thing again, just to mention the air, like again, I really love that exercise. <sighs> again, just blowing the loose air and just, so it's like, yes, you're taking big breaths, but you're not getting into this whole pattern of, I have to rhythmically breathe in time. I have to do this or that. Don't go into the whole, like, I have to do brass gym work or I have to do, you know, these specific breathing warm-ups with a metronome or, or anything technical. Really listen to your body. Let your body guide you through the process because it will always lead you to the right way, what, feel, what feels right. So yes, you want to do what feels right. Um, and when it comes to... Um, Ombudsman dystonia, how I feel like I've avoided injury, again, is the stretches, the jaw stretches, um, the upper body stretches and things like that. Um, because, how do I say this? I feel like the more you take care of your, your body, and you focus on, on improving your dystonia outside of your plane, the more beneficial and effective it's gonna be when you try to transfer it over to the instrument. Because um, again, the brain, the brain is a pain in the butt. <laughs>
is such a turd. It's just always like getting in the way. So um, if you guys haven't seen that video, the backward bicycle, and I know I posted that like last year, like several times because I was just so in love with it because it was just such a good representation of what focal dystonia feels like. Um, you know, it's this video of this guy that, that engineers a bike or he, he makes a bike and he basically um, turns the handles, he reverses them so that way when instead of when you turn the to the right the the wheel goes left and instead of to the left it goes right and then also i can't remember if he reversed the pedals not or not no i don't think he reversed the pedals yeah i think it was just the gear that he reversed because he's like oh this should be easy to overcome but he actually found that it took oh really hard work and so many people could not ride it and he took it on tour with him and tried to test to see how many people could ride it and nobody could ride it nobody could ride it you know even like two feet three feet um they couldn't get it even rolling without tipping over um so it's like he didn't realize how long it took him to learn how to ride it and then he tested it on his kid to see how long it took his kid to learn how to ride it and even his kid it took longer than normal so it's like having to learn a new brain pathway or learning how to do something that feels backwards it's like you're learning things backwards um it's very difficult to replace that old pathway of well this feels more normal this feels more safe this feels because the brain's going to freak out and say you're going to fall on your face if you do it this way you're going to fall on your face and you're going to crash and burn but you have to keep straight to the to the um the unwalked path to the pathway that that the road that's not taken <laughs> robert frost <laughs> um so yeah i hope this helped a lot and that you guys got um something out of it and that it helped um if you have any questions or anything just leave uh, anything in the comments and um i'd love to answer them um i'm gonna post this on my blog on my facebook page and hopefully my personal facebook page as well so yeah um, if any of you guys have any um, questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in the comment section, just go ahead and email me or message me on Facebook. Alright, thank you guys. I hope you have a good day. Bye!